the Buddha often referred to himself as a doctor. Treating the disease of suffering, offering a cure. Promising a state of health. That's why we're practicing, is to find that health. But as a doctor, the, the Buddha had a particular problem that regular physicians don't share, in that his state of health, or the state of health that he taught, was something that by definition we haven't experienced. Nirvana, the unconditioned. As he said, the purpose of the practice is to know what you've never known before, to reach what you've never reached before, to attain what you've never attained before. It's something totally outside the range of our experience. And so the Buddha had to find various ways to induce faith, both in himself as a trustworthy physician and in that state of health that he promised. And he's quite clear about the fact that until you reach it yourself, you're op operating on faith. Now, it's not faith that you see in some religions where the, the more outrageous and irrational the faith and the more the virtue there is in believing it. For the Buddha, reason was a way of inducing faith. But it wasn't proof. Just because something was reasonable doesn't mean that it's true. I could point out how reasonable the teachings were. Occasionally he would use his psychic powers. But for the most part, he relied on the fact that we're all suffering. That something deep down inside wants to find a way out. And we're not going to be satisfied with the kind of doctor who simply says, well, learn how to live with your disease. And you know, we see this all too often in the course of Buddhist history, that people often say, well, if everything's impermanent, then there really no, is no such thing as a total release from suffering, so we've got to learn how to accept things as they are. And just in the acceptance there you find happiness, you find a sense of contentment. Which is okay if your daily life is basically okay. But it's really nothing special. And if you think of all the people in the world right now who are undergoing all sorts of misery, what kind of message is that for them? Well, just learn to accept your misery and you'll be okay. Or as I read someplace, someone said, claimed to be quoting the Buddha, saying that he taught one thing only, which is suffering and the end of suffering. And they said, see, the Buddha says suffering and the end of suffering are one thing. One and the same, i.e. you learn how to accept the suffering and you stop suffering. Well, that's a misquote. The Buddha simply said, all I teach is suffering and the end of suffering. He didn't say they were one thing. The word one thing doesn't even appear in the statement. And it would go against all the other teachings, teachings about the unconditioned, teachings about nirvana as haven. Totally free from any kind of condition at all. And he did offer a genuine health, a genuine cure that will take us beyond where we are right now. It's found by looking into the present moment, but seeing through to the present moment to something that lies beyond space and time. That's the whole point of the teaching. The Buddha never said that all things are impermanent. He simply said all conditioned things are impermanent. All fabricated things are impermanent, inconstant, transient. But that doesn't apply to the unconditioned, the unfabricated. So we're here working on faith in something we haven't seen. But as I said earlier, the Buddha is depending on our strong sense that we are suffering. 
He says our sufferings are like a person being faced with the prospect of being pulled into a pit of burning embers. So suppose there were a man, two other strong men had grabbed hold of him and they were dragging him into a pit of burning embers. Wouldn't he struggle to get away? Twist his body this way and that to get away? And the answer is, of course, yes. You don't rest content by just letting your, and let, just let yourself be dragged into the pit of embers. You do what you can to get out. And the Buddha's relying on that. desperate desire not to suffer. If we weren't suffering, we could, we could set up all kinds of objections to his teaching. I'm not going to follow this until everything is absolutely proven to my satisfaction. There was once a person who actually went to the Buddha and said that, and the Buddha refused to teach him. He said, give me someone who is honest, who is no deceiver, i.e. someone who admits that the problem of suffering is more important than the pride you might have in refusing to accept a teaching. If you're really suffering and you genuine, genuinely see the, the danger of your suffering, then you go for the path. Because if you believe human effort can put an end to suffering, it means that okay, your intentions Make a difference. Your efforts make a difference. And you can't rely on some outside power to do it for you. Or you can't simply wait for the universe to take care of the problem for you, impersonally. It's something you've got to do, which means that your intentions make a difference. This is why the meditation focuses on our intentions. So it can bring our intentions more under our control, because we realize it's our intentions that play a huge role in making us suffer to begin with. We've got to learn how to tame them. And the meditation starts with something very simple. Just focus on your breath. Stay there. Don't go anywhere else. And then use whatever techniques you can figure out to help the mind stay there. Sometimes it means evaluating the breath. Sometimes it means telling yourself, okay, no evaluation, just stay right here. Rest. Plug the mind into the breath as it is. In other words, the taming here also means learning how to read your mind, and then choosing from the various techniques that the Buddha offers. the precise technique that really fits your problem right here, right now. And as a doctor, he offers a wide range of medicines, a wide variety of medicines, focusing on the breath, recollection of the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha for times when you're feeling discouraged. recollection of your own generosity, your own virtue, when you start feeling unworthy of the path. Remind yourself that you do have some goodness in you. Recollection of the qualities that would lead to a birth in the heavenly realms, realizing that you have those as well. A sense of shame at doing something that's harmful, and the fear of the consequences of unskillful actions. You've got those qualities, too. Contemplation of the body for times when you're feeling lustful, looking at what you really have here in the body. If you were to take the skin off, would you feel lust for any body? Contemplation of death for when you're feeling complacent. And there's contemplation of nirvana to inspire you. When you realize that there really is a way out of this, it's worth all the effort that you put into it. Because it is a path that involves effort. Going against your greed, anger, and delusion is not an easy thing. And it's all too easy to rationalize and say, well, that's, I'll save that for some other time.
I'll devote my life to meritorious activities instead. But the problem of suffering still is eating away, eating away. And it comes a point when you have to realize. In AA they say you have to hit rock bottom, but as the Buddha said not everybody has to hit rock bottom. There are the, those who, who like a, a horse who only has to be told whip or shown the shadow of a whip is ready to go. Then the others actually have to see the whip. Those are the ones that are a little bit less heedful. Then those are the ones who have to feel the touch of the whip on their skin. There are those who have to have, feel the whip touch into the flesh under the skin. The really complacent ones are the ones who have to feel the whip go into their bone. In other words, you have to really suffer. Those are the ones who have to hit rock bottom. But it's your choice. At what point are you going to look at the sufferings in your life and decide, okay, enough of this. I've really got to do something about the habits of the mind that keep creating the suffering. Because there are two kinds of suffering. There's the stress simply of changing things, and then there's the stress and the suffering that you add on top of that through craving, clinging, ignorance. The natural stress of physical things, compounded things, that's going to stay the same regardless of whether you're enlightened, awakened. But if you're awakened, then that second kind of suffering, the suffering that's added on top, just won't exist. And it's the second kind of suffering that actually creates a bridge to the first. And those we suffer from things outside because the mind latches onto them. It has plans for them that go against their way they can be. We try to make our happiness depend on these things, and it keeps crashing through, crashing through. So instead we learn to train the mind so that it can look deeper inside, so we can understand how and why we create suffering and how we can stop. And to see what happens, what's left there when we stop. And at that point, language breaks down. This is why the Buddha had to be very careful when he talked about nirvana. He talked about it very rarely, enough to let people know it was there. But he didn't go into long descriptions because it's not the sort of thing you can describe. Our language is suited for conditioned reality. It both describes conditioned reality and it creates conditioned realities. But nirvana lies outside the, the net of that language, the net that the language can, can capture. It doesn't even have a location. Everything that we know in life has a location, whether it's a physical location or a mental location i.e. you can locate a particular feeling in your mind or a particular perception. But nirvana has no location, no relationship to space or time. It doesn't feed on anything. Nothing can feed on it. It doesn't cause anything. Nothing can cause it. The path doesn't cause nirvana. It just leads us to where it is in the same way that the, the road to Glacier National Park doesn't cause Glacier National Park. But it gets you there. So even though we may not see Glacier National Park, we still, once we decide that that's where we want to go, we turn our steps in that direction and keep at it, do what we can to encourage ourselves along the way, using whichever of the medicines the Buddha prescribes to treat the various illnesses that are keeping us away from the destination, and to develop the strength that we need to get to our destination. It may be wrong to focus on the destination all the time. As I've said many times before, if, you, if you're going to a mountain on the horizon, if you, keep, if you simply keep your eyes on the mountain while you're driving, of course you're going to drive off the road. But every now and then it's good to look up and see, ah oh, yes, there is that mountain. It exists. It 
Now for us, we can't look at the horizon and see nirvana. But we have the word of the Buddha, his noble disciples, the great Ajans. And if you compare that with the word of most of the people in the world, it's much more trustworthy, much more deserving of faith. So as we follow the path, we're dealing with likelihoods, what seems likely, what seems reasonable, what seems possible. We're also heading to something that part of the mind might keep on saying, that's impossible. But you have to weigh. Question, how much more do you want to suffer? This is the only thing that offers a way out, an absolute cure for the disease. And it's up to you to decide whether or not that's compelling. 